is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. We are so happy to have you here worshiping with us. Um, excited to see the Holy Spirit move through all the different aspects of this service. I invite you to stand as we uh, start off in worship. Each day I rise, I'll fix my eyes on your promises over and over that I am loved no matter what. And you are enough over and over. This is the day that you have made. Oh, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that you Crosspoint, how y'all doing today? Yeah. Hey, and it's finally warming up outside. Spring is coming in the middle of January. <laughs> hey, we have a lot of things going on. Uh, to begin with, a uh, reminder that after second service, the pizza with the pastors, if you've been like new and attending in the last three months, six months, nine months, this is something you're invited to as a way for you to get to know the leadership a little bit better. Uh, I'll be there. We'll have some elders there. We'll have pizza, and it's a great time to get to know each other. So if you have not signed up, and if you would like to be a part of that, uh, please talk to me so I can make sure there's enough pizza for you, and that's right after second service. And then next week, one of my favorite times of the year is our annual soup cook-off. 
It's a fundraiser for our teens who are going uh, to, I believe it's Honduras uh, this summer. And I, I said, I love this time. Uh, we have a bunch of people who are entering in pots of soup, and it costs $20 to do that. And we got some great prizes. We got, for the winter, we have an overnight stay at Thumper Pond with water park passes. Uh, other prizes, we've got goose game cards, autographed picture of me, uh, other stuff like that. And uh, if you're not entering a pot of soup, come and eat. You get to try all the different soups. We have, I think we've got 20 signed up right now and get to vote on the winner. So that is next Sunday after second service. You're going to want to come and be a part of that. And then in two weeks, it is our annual meeting. And a few details about that. First of all, you know, usually we have two services every Sunday, 9 a.m., 10.30. On that Sunday, only one service at 9 a.m. So that means if you usually come to this service, then come to this service. Nothing changes. But instead of second service, we're doing the annual meeting during that time. And a couple things. On the Connection Center back there, we do have our uh, annual reports. If you want to take a look at that, you can go ahead and pick that up. Also, we have giving statements back there. If you've given the last year and if you want the IRS to, you know, give you an exemption or whatever, uh, that is in the back. Go and pick that up. One thing to look forward to next week is at our annual meeting, we do have an election on uh, electing elders, and next week we'll have more information about the candidates that will be available. But feel free to go and pick one of these up. Well, we have a special guest that's going to be sharing for a little bit this morning. Thomas, if you want to come up here with your crew. While you're coming up, one more thing just to be aware of is we do have a table in the back. Our teens, also for a fundraiser, are selling Michelangelo pizzas. And uh, some teens will be doing that, so check that out as well. But Thomas, Thomas is one of our elders, and you recently got back with this wonderful crew right here on a special adventure a few weeks ago. Tell us about it. And we'll have some pictures that uh, you can rambly, Joe, you can put up on the screen. <laughs> Are we on? We'll get there. Oh, there it is. Okay. So I want to take advantage of this, this opportunity to uh, share with everyone what we are. Emily, my wife over here on the end, it's my wife Emily Tater, and uh, she and I facilitate the young adult group here at Cross Point. You might have heard it referred to as the young adult group, you might have heard to it as the LAFF group, which stands for Lost and Found, and that is what we are about. We are about a community of 18 to 30 year olds um, that have the opportunity to be in a biblical, safe, community, a community where they can come together, have, a, have an opportunity to gather and uh, learn about Jesus, share life experiences together, and grow in a safe, smaller group type community. So that is what LAF is about. Um, beginning of January here, uh, we had the opportunity to go down to the Passion Conference. Good luck. <laughs> Passion Conference in Atlanta, Tom, Georgia. Thomas, I'm sure you'll be seeing that picture again. <laughs> That's one of our gas station stops. And uh, well, why did we go down there? I'm going to let Emily and uh, share about what we experienced at Passion. And then this is Marco and Brock, and they're going to share about what, what God did in their lives during that, that time and what he's been doing beyond that time for them. But uh, Emily, if you're ready to share, come on over. Yeah, so um, I didn't know what the Passion Conference was. Kay told me about it last year. Um, and it's a conference from 18 to 25-year-olds, so it's a little bit smaller span than what we have for our ministry. Um, last year, no one was really like, ah, you know, I think one person was going to go. And then now this year, it's like, I don't know, fire was lit underneath them, and they were pretty pumped about going. So a uh, conference, it was down in Atlanta, Georgia. We rented a 12-passenger van, filled it with 10 young adults, um, two of which we had never met, two of which we only had met once that came that these guys had invited. Um, and yeah, we, we drove down. We kind of had a stop in between. You can see, um, well, this was the conference, but if you guys see us in like climbing gear, it looks like we actually went zip lining in an underground limestone cave in Louisville, Kentucky. And that was fun. Yeah, they still had some stuff lit up from Christmas. So that was a kind of a pit stop in the middle that we had a lot of fun with. But then, yeah, once we got down there, it was... Um, it was pretty incredible. The, uh, it was, there were 55,000, that was our crew, 
That was the day we got back. Um, there were 55,000 kids that filled the Mercedes-Benz Stadium down in Atlanta. And the first, I mean, I looked over at Thomas, and when we first started worshiping, him and I were just, just crying because it was incredible to see a generation that just wants to live for Jesus, wants to grow for the Lord. And, I mean, we have the privilege of being with these guys. Um, so, yeah, lots of, I mean, honestly, it was just bam, bam, bam with speakers and worship and um, the Holy Spirit was there, and it was it was incredible. Um, like I told these guys, the only thing I'd change is we have to try and carve out time just to to process because it was just, I mean, it's like an onslaught. It was beautiful, but it was like we need to, like, talk about things. So, like, on, on our bus ride or on our van ride back and even on our ride home from Buffalo up to Purim, it was really cool. We had an experience time of prayer for about 45 minutes in the, in the Armada as Thomas drove through the not-so-great weather. Um, but it was, uh, it was a really awesome time, so I'll let these guys share about how God worked in their life. So, yeah, um, the first thing I'll say is they did not care about our sleep schedule, and I'm still recovering from that. <laughs> but apart from that, man, that was an experience. Like, I've never, I've never been in such, like, a, a, a potent area where the Holy Spirit can just work, right? Now, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's a, it, I'm telling you, like, when, it, when you come from a small church, right, and then you move over into, like, a, a, an arena filled with 55,000 people your age who are worshiping the same God as you, there's something in the air that's, like, tangible that you can, like, grab onto and you can pull it down. And I don't think that it's, it was just available there, but rather, like, it's always available, but sometimes the everyday life can get in the way of that. So what this Passion Conference did for me was it opened my eyes to the holiness of God, and as well as that, it opened my eyes that there's like a little lever to pull down to call on heaven and bring it down and, and, and spread it to the rest of us. This is what that, that Passion Conference did for me. Okay, so the Lord did a lot for me on that trip, but what he spoke to me most on was love. Uh, something I've struggled with my entire life, like understanding what love really is. And when it was painted to me what he really did on the cross for every single one of us and how much he actually loves us. He loves every single one of us so much that he doesn't look at himself as higher than us. Like, he looks at us as an equal to him. And just trying to comprehend that just breaks me. It's just beautiful. And we have the choice every single day whether we want him in our life or if we want to walk away from him. We've made that choice once, but you make that choice every single day. And just keep choosing him. Keep following him. When he tells you to walk, walk. When he tells you to go pray for that person, pray for him. What God spoke to me is just don't be afraid to walk his walk because it's going to bring you so much, so much further than yours will. So just to wrap it up, um, thank you as a church body for supporting the young adult group, um, allowing us and facilitating our opportunity to go down there and experience that large type of community and, uh, and allowing the spirit to pop the lid off of these two young gentlemen and many others. Uh, after we got back, I had them write down, each one of them write down and their experience and what God was doing in their lives and moving within them. And there's much, much more um, to share. So if any of you are interested in learning more about the conference or what we're doing or, hey, we've got somebody we know that fits your age range and we, you know, does it work? Should they come to your group? Come see us. Talk to these young gentlemen and uh, we'd, we'd love to share. Hey, thank you. Well, I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward right now. Uh, I'm going to pray for us and we'll receive an offering. Uh, remember to stay seated while the plate's being passed, and Amy will have you stand when it's made its way to the back of the room. So if you join me in prayer. Oh, Father, I want to thank you so much for the work that you did with our laugh group uh, on that trip. What an incredible experience to get maybe a, a taste of heaven in the midst of that worship and all the challenges. And as they continue to process what they've learned, may your spirit be at work within them 
and continue to change them and continue to use them to just spread your kingdom. And for us, Lord, we, we want a taste of you this morning. And Father, may you shift our gaze toward you to have a, just a deeper understanding of your heart. May you bless this time. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Heavenly Father who loves us very richly, and he invites us to come before him in prayer. And over the next few songs, if you'd like to be prayed over by the elders and prayer team members there in the back of the room, feel free just to head back there, and it'll be their honor to carry your burden and lift you up before our Heavenly Father. Me. 
this morning in need of your spirit whether we are struggling or whether we're in a time of rejoicing and blessing God we need you every hour Lord I pray for your power to come down upon your people I pray for rejuvenation I pray for healing I pray for all the things that you do that your spirit does be our counselor, be our comforter, be our keeper. We love you. I pray that you would help us grow in our love of you and our knowledge of who you are and your greatness. Help us live lives that are glorifying to you, to make choices that are glorifying to you. And God, when it's difficult, I pray that you would give us your strength. We need your strength. We need your spirit. May we be a church who loves the way you love. But we need your help to do it, God, I pray. Give us that strength this morning in your name. Amen. Thank you, team. I'd like to invite the kids to come forward right now. Uh, if you're new with us, every week we pray over the kids before they... So kids, come on up. Right, if you join me in prayer, 
Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for every child that we have here on stage, everyone, which is an incredible blessing from you. And Father, I just want to pray that we would steward these kids well, that these kids would just fall in love with you. We ask that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, kids, you can head on back. So two years ago, there was an interesting news story out of Oregon. So apparently, there was this young mom who uh, had to do a quick shopping trip. It went to the local grocery store. All she had to pick up was a gallon of milk and some meat. So uh, she thought because she'd be in and out of the store, uh, she left her child in the back seat of the car and left the car running. And she ran on in. Uh, in the few minutes that she was inside... Uh, some thief happened to be going around the parking lot. He saw the car run, and he thought, great, an easy steal. So he goes up, gets in the car, and off he goes. Now, I, I don't know how far he got. He probably got a couple blocks and realized he was not alone in the car. Looked to the back, and there's this kid back there. So he, he turned around, went back to the parking lot, uh, found the mother who was frantically looking for the vehicle, rolled down the window, and he basically said, what kind of mother are you to leave your child unattended in the back? And he even threatened that he was going to call and report her to the police for being such a horrible parent. And she quickly grabbed her child, pulled him out, and that wonderful thief, then uh, as any ethical American, he drove off with the car that he just stole. And at the time of reporting the story, they were still looking for the thief and looking for the stolen car. Now, I, I look at that story, and I, I ask the question of kind of what's the lesson there? Um, maybe the first lesson is never leave your child unattended in a car at a grocery store. Maybe the other lesson is that the, the thief realized that it's one thing to deal with the law. It's a whole other thing to try to take care of a kid because parenting is hard. We've been doing this series the last few weeks on the family, specifically on parenting. Uh, what does godly parenting look like? And I, I've been mostly addressing parents, but uh, there's many of you in this room that don't have kids at home. If that's you, think of some child in your life that you have influence over, whether it's a, a sibling or a grandchild or even someone within this community that we call the, the Cross Point family. And uh, we started off looking at what is God's design for the home. You know, all the different things we aim for, whether it's well-behaved kids, kids who have great jobs, kids who excel in sports. Uh, nothing wrong with any of those, but that's not the goal that God has for the home. That uh, the home was meant to be an environment that cultivates Christ followers. That's what has eternal value. We've been using this uh, metaphor of a camera and the idea of, you know, you got to set the target. you got to know what you're aiming at. Last week, we talked about uh, getting the right filter and equipment that, that one of the greatest assets that a parent has is their example. Because an example of saying one thing and doing another can destroy a child's faith. But when someone truly lives out their faith, it has the power to inspire greatly. And the greatest weapon we have at all is the very power of God that if you're a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit within you that enables you to do that. And this all continues to prompt the question of, okay, we see that's the goal in how powerful examples are, but how do we do this? How do we develop those kinds of homes? And today we're going to look at setting up the shot. How do we do that? And I, I want to remind you of something I said a few weeks ago. You know, I would love to stand up here as one of those people that says, oh, I am a successful parent. I've got this all figured out. And I don't. I am in the midst of this myself. I, I have kids ages 7, 9, and 11. Right now in my home, I'm trying to guide my son through grieving the Packer game last night. Uh, <laughs> there are issues that we're dealing with. And what I'm sharing with you this morning in the last few weeks really are kind of what I'm on the journey myself of learning, and I'm inviting you to come along. So uh, as we get into this, 
get into setting up the shot and how do we create a home that's an environment that cultivates Christ followers. If you join me in prayer. Father, I want to thank you for this time today. And, and I just want to ask that the result of this time of looking at your word brings us one step closer to be a home that's really what you designed it to do. One that is developing children who haven't just heard about you, but who know you. And Lord, parenting, it, it is tough. Being a grandparent is tough. Uh, just being in a community is tough. And I said, Lord, give us a vision of how to do this better. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we're going to do a deep dive into one main verse this morning. We're going to be the book, in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Many of you know this verse. This is one of the, the main Bible verses often quoted about parenting. A little bit, bit of the context is we have the Apostle Paul who's been teaching about relationships. Talks about relationships in the church. And then he gets into the family. He talks about how husbands and wives relate to each other. And then he addresses parents and children. He says this in Ephesians 6, 4. And Joe, you're going to have to hit it for me. Because I turned this off. That is why. <laughs> Let me see if we work here. There we go. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. We have what not to do and then what to do. And we're going to look at this backwards. We're going to start with the what to do, and then we're going to come back to the what not to do. What to do. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And a starting point is just to remember that our children need this. Uh, Flannery O'Connor once made the statement that stories of pious children tend to be false. Our children don't start off as this wonderful, God-honoring, selfless, parent-obeying children. No, children start off being quite sinful. Uh, they're not at a place that they're following God. Uh, it goes back to where as parents, we want to take kids from this place of not following God to this place of following God. And this verse says, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, bringing them up, I, I did some research into the original language here, and there's something to get lost in translation. The, the word for bringing them up really is the, the same word as most often used for nurture. It, it's not just, you know, commanding something from a distance. Nurture implies care. It implies relationship. It's maybe the idea of, uh, you think about Jesus with his disciples in which uh, he was trying to bring them from this place of maturity. And you have fine times in which he had just tenderly being patient with them, patiently teaching them. Other times that Jesus uses tough love with them. It's his active involvement in bringing them up, of moving them to a different point. You know, kind of a, a reoccurring, reoccurring point throughout this whole series is that a parent job is to nurture the spiritual health of their children. And how to do that? That's not what I wanted. Bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, the word training is often translated as discipline. Now, I don't know what you think of when you hear the word discipline. Maybe some of you think back to this verse. Do not withhold, should be withhold discipline from a child. If you punish them with a rod, they will not die. Punch them with the rod and save them from death. Some of you look back in the home that you grew up in, and this is your parents' favorite verse. Maybe you remember that rod very, very well. And uh, some of you look back on that and the way that your parents used discipline made you the kind of person you are today. Sadly, there are many parents, you may have grown up in this home, which is first was abused, in which it was used as a license to, to physically abuse you. Uh, the point here, though, is discipline is created by God to be a good thing. And this is one kind of discipline. This is, I call it punitive discipline. This is when it's a punishment, but that's not always what discipline is. Often it's a discipline, but there's a positive form of discipline also. 
You know, one thing that I've been trying to do lately is work on my running. We have a, a treadmill in the basement. I, I go down there quite a bit. And what I want to do is I want to get my body more healthy. I want to build up my lungs a bit. So I go and I run for a while. Now, do I do that because I enjoy running? No. I'm not one of those people that say, oh, I'm going to do something really fun right now. Let's go for a run. I can think of a million other things that I'd rather be doing than hanging out on the treadmill. But it's called a discipline. It's something that I put my body through for the purpose of moving to another goal. You know, I, many of you, myself included, have spiritual disciplines. Like every day I have a time set aside to be in God's word and, and, and to study God's word and pray. And I love being in God's word, but there are days when I'm really busy and it takes work to do that. It's a discipline to make that happen. It's a discipline that makes me, takes me from one point to another, that another is drawing close to God. Really, if I were to put a definition on discipline, I would say this, that discipline is practices that can include punishments that move us in a specific direction. In Hebrews 12, it talks about how God does this for us. Hebrews 12, 7 says, endure hardship as a discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? There's a few verses later. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Here you have the goal of discipline from God's perspective, to produce a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. And by the way, the word discipline here is the exact same word that Paul uses in Ephesians for training. Now, in this Hebrews passage, there is definitely part of it that's talking about punitive discipline. Uh, it talks about, in verse 6, about God chastising us. But that line, endure hardship as a discipline, it doesn't say that hardship is a punishment. It talks about it as something difficult that God is putting his children in for a specific purpose. See, discipline, again, is practices that in include punishments that move you toward a goal. You know, when I think about parenting and training our children toward Christ, different practices, and then that can be discipline. The, the Proverbs passage about disciplining your children, I, I tell you, that, that's God's word. You know, you hear about those parents, and maybe you grew up in this kind of home in which a parent just wants to be their child's best friend. Uh, if you are a parent, God did not give you that job to be your child's best friend. He gave you that job to be their parent. And punitive discipline is a, a part of that. If your child is doing something that is destructive, love does not allow them to do that. Love tells you to intervene, to bring in consequences, to get them on the right track. Now, that being said, punishment is never for the sake of punishment. Uh, punishment's always for the purpose of restoring them, of getting them where they should be. Now, that being said, you also have homes that it is punishment, 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 and we forget that discipline is not just punitive. It is also creating formative practices. That one of the key ways that we nurture the spiritual health of children is to create practices that cultivate spiritual formation. Like, let me give you some examples. Now, you are here right now, and if you're a parent with kids at home, I'm assuming your kids are here. You've created a discipline by having them in this place in which they're in a community and they're learning about God together. That is a discipline. That is a spiritually formative practice. Many of you have a practice in your families of a family mealtime. That's a discipline. It takes work to make that happen. As busy as schedules are, it, it is a challenge getting everyone together at the same time to enjoy a meal and have a conversation. But what that practice does, it teaches your family how to interact with each other. It teaches you how to love each other. In many ways, a family mealtime is a training ground for your kids to engage in a larger community. Uh, 
There's a practice that many of you have and my family has. I would love to tell you that we are, do this all the time. The reality is it doesn't happen as often as it should. But when we can, we try to do a family devotional time. Where Amy and the kids and I, we uh, do some kind of Bible study together. And if you've never, never done that before and want to try something with that, at the end of the message, I'm going to give you some resources that have worked with my family. Uh, another practice that some families have is finding ways to serve together. I, I had one family in my previous church that they really wanted to do a family mission trip. So it is something that uh, I probably will never have the money to do, which is they had their kids in middle school and high school, and they went and they spent a week serving in Africa together. Not cheap, but I tell you, talk about a powerful, formative experience in the lives of their kids. Uh, one thing I've tried to do the last couple times I've taken the team down to the Twin Cities to serve is I, I've taken my son, Kate, along. Because it's putting him in a setting that is spiritually formative. And you can think of all kinds of other ideas of different practices that families can do to put their kids in a setting that they're being spiritually formed. You know, uh, let's go back to this verse right here. Bring them up in the training, disciplines, and instruction of the Lord. You have this other side of that, which is instruction, which is teaching. Now, I, I know in this room there's some of you that, man, you got the Bible down. You are very comfortable teaching your kids. For some of you, man, that is super intimidating, the idea of teaching your kids about the Christian faith. Uh, for some of you, there's nothing more scary. And the uh, last couple of weeks, I've been doing this image. I've had this uh, bucket up here full of ping pong balls, one representing every hour of the week. And how uh, when we think that it's just up to the church to train our kids, well, there's only a limited time. At the most, your kids here at church three hours a week. Parents have so much more influence. So I want to encourage you, though. It is the job of parents to teach your children. It's not the job of the church to do that, but the church can be an incredible resource that you can use. And if you're intimidated with the idea of instructing your kids, use the church as a resource. Use the children's ministry. Use the youth ministry. We are here to come alongside of you. And if you're intimidated, how about learning with your kids. How about saying, man, I really want to grow in my walk with God. I want to learn more about his, Lord, his word. Go on that journey and inviting your kids to join you. I, I've talked to a number of people that the way that they have come to know the Bible is because they've taken that approach. Because of their kids, they have chosen to learn with them. Put your children in settings where they can learn about the faith all going back to being a home that cultivates Christ followers, a home in which parents are bringing up their children in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, remember, that's the positive, that's what we're supposed to do, but there's that negative side. Again, the beginning, fathers, do not exasperate your children. So what does that mean? And that can look like a number of different things. Uh, sometimes as parents, we have that situation that and there's a specific way we want our kids to turn out. There's a specific person we want our kids to be, whether it's a career, whether it's academically, whether it's just thinking in a certain way. And, you know, remember as kids, you had that little game that you had that, like that, that block that you're trying to fit in that round hole or hit the, get the right shape in the right hole. Sometimes we can try to try to slam our kids to fit in a hole that God did not make them to fill. That's one way to exasperate them. But uh, there are other ways that we can do that too. And one thing that we can easily do is pick the wrong battles to fight. Parents, there is great wisdom in choosing your battles wisely. Because the battles that matter above all else are about their walk with Christ. Many of you are familiar with Dr. James Dobson. He's the founder of Focus on the Family and uh, really for several decades, has been a leading authority on Christian parenting. And, and Dr. Dobson is a strong believer in, in discipline, a, a strong believer in the parent exercising authority from a young age. 
uh, there was one time he was out with a group of friends eating lunch. And the waitress recognized his voice from the radio and introduced herself and said, Dr. Dobson, I need your advice on something. She explained that she was a single mom with a 12-year-old daughter. And she said, Dr. Dobson, every night my daughter and I, we fight over and over again about the same issue. And she's so strong-willed, and we can't get past that. And Dr. Dobson asked, well, what's the issue? And she said, well, my daughter wants to use my razor to shave her legs. And I keep on telling her she's not old enough to do that. It's not appropriate for her to do that now. She needs to wait till she's 15 or 16 to do that. And she will not let it go. We fight over and over again. And Dr. Dobson said he started thinking about the years ahead and the type of issues that this family would be dealing with. On how, number one, dealing with this girl owning her faith. How temptations like drugs and alcohol and premarital sex. And Dobson thought about that, looked at the mom and said, here's my advice for you. Right now, go to the store and buy that girl a razor. The point was, as he looked at the battles that were coming up, this was not a hill worth dying for. And parents... Again, the most important hills to die on are the ones about where your kids stand in their walk with God. Wisdom is deciding what battles to fight. And if there's a battle that does not involve your kid's salvation, that's getting in the way of your relationship with them and your spiritual influence with them, then it's worth asking the question, is this a hill to die on? Charles Stanley used to often say that when it came to to these issues, he says, keep your children on your team to do whatever you can to have that relationship so that when it comes to those deep spiritual conversations, you have their trust. You have the re relationship that earns you the right to be heard on those big issues. One final thought kind of along with this, uh, Walt Mueller is a, a writer who he spent his entire career studying youth culture and training parents on how to navigate the culture. Because, man, if you spend any time out there in the world, you know that it's a mess out there. There is all kinds of influences trying to pull our kids away from God and into destructive behaviors. And, and he talks about how parents, they, they tend to fall in one of two camps. One camp is to be very protective and do whatever they can to protect their kids from the culture. The other camp is to just be a, a free-for-all of, you know, I trust my kids. My kids can do whatever they want. I hope they figure it out. And what he tells parents to do is he says, monitor your kids, but do not put them in a monastery. Meaning that uh, if they're going to grow up and move out and be in this world, they have to be able to engage with the world to know how to navigate it. And better form to learn how to navigate the world when they can have parents guiding them through that. It says also, as parents, we should be monitoring our kids. Teens in this room, I know you're not going to like this, but hear me out. There are so many things out there on social media and technology that are damaging. And parents, if your kids have phones, they have access to the internet, you should know what your kids are looking at. You should know what kind of movies, what kind of music your kids are listening to. And perhaps here's something that might work in your home. Uh, one thing that I, I try to do with my kids, and I know a lot of parents who do this, is with movies and with music, take the time to listen to it with your kids and talk with them about the messages, how to discern the messages and how to compare it to God's word. And just one idea you might try in your home that might help cultivate kids who are Christ followers and cultivate kids who are equipped to make better choices when it comes to the messages that are out there. Now, I, I recognize all this stuff, talking about uh, instructing your kids in practices. It takes time. It takes work to do that. There's a sacrifice involved. I've been looking at the Old Testament recently and kind of studying ancient culture. And uh, back in ancient times, in uh, all of the pagan nations surrounding the Israelite people, 
there's a common theme in their worship. They had all these different gods that they worshipped, and uh, we look in horror at this, but it was common to have child sacrifice in worship. The idea is families had a lot of kids, so why not sacrifice a couple kids to make the gods happy? And if you sacrifice your children, then the gods would bless you. Belief was, was that your kids were expendable for your own convenience, for your own blessings. But not so with the Israelite people. Because God gave them specific commands about that. God said that uh, child sacrifice was detestable. The Israelites, they were not allowed to do that. Instead, God told them, teach your kids, teach your kids, teach your kids. There was a theme of make sure you're passing your faith down to the next generation. In fact, there's a passage in the book of Numbers, uh, 8.25, talking about priests. Which the priests, you know, they had the kind of celebrity job that everyone came to them to know how to follow God and how to worship. Do you know that God actually commanded the priests that at the age of 50, they were supposed to stop offering sacrifices? They were to retire from that leadership position. And for the rest of their life, they were supposed to assist the younger priests in training them on how to do their job. They were to devote the rest of their life to pouring into the next generation. And sadly... The Israelite people did not often take this very seriously. Because instead of sacrificing their children, they were to sacrifice for the children. We have in, in Judges, this is a reoccurring theme, that after that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals, and it lists all these other gods, and they went right back into this mindset of, sacrificing their children. And I have to wonder how different the story of the Israelite people might have been if they had taken God's command seriously and God's command to pass the faith down to the next generation. Because passing the faith to the next generation is worth the sacrifice. And I look at our culture today. Now, we look in horror on what happened back then, but... You know, today, probably the most glaring example is abortion, where a child is sacrificed for the sake of our convenience. But as parents, we do it in other ways. Many of us, we find our self-worth in our kids. So we push our kids to achieve, not always in areas that they want to achieve, but where we want them to, because it makes us feel better. That's an example of sacrificing our children for our own benefit. Or... When it comes to spiritual practices in the home, because they take work, we easily kind of push them off to the side because, yeah, and it's just not convenient. It's so much easier not to do that. And in the process, we sacrifice the spiritual health of our children. And do you know who's guilty of doing that? I am guilty of doing that. You know, in my family, we have a practice of doing devotions, but there's a lot of times in which I get to the evening, I'm just tired, and it doesn't happen. And I'm sacrificing my children's spiritual health because for me, I'm just tired, and it's not convenient. The truth is, spiritually raising our kids is the most important thing that we can do. If you're a grandparent, if there's some other child in your life being a spiritual influence on their life is one of the most important things that you can do. Let's take that job seriously. I mentioned earlier that uh, if you want to try some new practices, if you want to try family devotions, uh, just some possible resources that you could use, I'll share with you briefly kind of what my family's done. When my kids were really small, uh, we just did Bible stories with them. Uh, in fact, I have some friends that wanted to do that uh, with their grandkids. Their problem was their grandchildren lived on the other side of the world. So they started doing where multiple times a week they would Zoom with their grandkids and do Bible stories with them. All as a part of helping to create some of those spiritually formative experiences from a young age. Uh, one thing that uh, my kids really enjoy now and that I've really enjoyed using is um, there's an organization called Keys for Kids. 
And they have an app you can put into your phone that every day it gives you a devotional for the kids. It has a, a Bible reading of five to ten verses. There's a story that goes with it, some discussion questions. And that has worked really well for my kids right now. Uh, one thing that can work well with older kids, uh, there's a website called The Bible Project that what they've done is they have taken the books of the Bible and do short 10-minute videos explaining what the books are about. Also, they've done that with different themes in the Bible, and it, it just creates some short resources that, I mean, adults can learn a lot too with them, but it can be used in a, a short setting to help teens understand more of what God's Word is about. And that's just a, a few ideas that work for us. There's a ton of amazing things out there. The point is find something to develop spiritual practices in your homes to help develop your kids. You join me in prayer. Father, I want to thank you for this time. And uh, the home is a very sacred place. And Father, I, I think we're all on this journey together. I know I'm on this journey of learning how to do this. And I know there's so often that I fail in doing this with my kids. And Father, I just want to pray that maybe we all come from here today asking the question, is there one practice? Maybe it's devotions, maybe it's serving together. Uh, something that our families can do to better put our kids in these settings where they can grow in their knowledge and their love of you. And Father, I do want to pray, for, pray over our kids right now. I know the enemy has a target on their back. Uh, there's a culture that's constantly telling them that it's not about you. It's that the center of the universe is them. And that uh, faith is disposable for whatever makes them happy. And Lord, I, I want to pray against that. I want to pray for your spiritual protection over our kids, a protection over all the destructive choices that are out there. And pray that our, you would do the work in our kids' lives to draw them toward you. Father, maybe even some of our kids may inspire their parents to have a deeper walk with you. We ask for your protection over our homes. And for those here who don't have kids at home right now, may you show them ways that they can support our families here and ways that they can support the kids here in our church community. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, next week we're going to shift direction and we're going to talk about parenting parents. Because I know many of us have aging parents or are on the road to be doing that. Now you have a great week. All the things that I've held you, the vanities, the whispered in my ear. What would I do if they all disappeared? Riches and fame and all that they could buy I've come to find they never satisfy What would I gain if my soul surprised? I don't want to love what the world loves I don't want to chase what the world loves